Well, hello everyone. I'm Betsy O'Hagan. I manage web and marketing for Western Cuyahoga Audubon Society, a chapter of the National Audubon Society that's based here in uh, sort of the northeastern region of uh, Ohio. And uh, we're based in the Cleveland, Ohio area. And today we're going to talk with Ryan Tremba, who is uh, an ecologist uh, with the Cuyahoga Valley National Park. And Ryan will be our speaker um, on Tuesday, September 1st. And Ryan is going to discuss hybridization of cerulean and perula warblers, which is a really interesting topic. And there's a lot of science happening about it now. Um, and, and a lot of discussion, I understand, in the various research results. But uh, Ryan can tell us more about that. So Ryan, hi, how are you? And uh, you know, tell us who you are, where you are, where are you, and uh, the important work that you do. Yeah, hey, um, I'm Ryan Trimbath. As Betsy said, I'm a biologist, ecologist, whatever you want to call me um, is fine, as long as I'm outside. Uh, I'm fine with it. <laughs> um, so I'm uh, currently working for Cuyahoga Valley National Park. Um, I manage our deer management program uh, and work on various other projects such as, you know, uh, river related projects, um, parks working towards uh, a, a study of wh whether or not we could become designated as a wild and scenic river. So it's a very diverse opportunity for me here. Um, specifically, the Cerulean Warbler work came from a time when I was actually working at Summit Metro Parks, um, the, the observations did come from within the jurisdictional boundary of the Cuyahoga Valley National Park, though. Um, so right now, today, I'm out uh, near Peninsula, Ohio, overlooking the, the Ohio and Erie Canal towpath and um, taking a break from doing some vegetation monitoring to, to talk to you all. Uh, that's awesome. Hey, Ryan, can you switch your viewer for a second and uh, see if we can see what you see? Yeah, so here I am. I'm sitting kind of on this like, uh, you know, ridge. There's a kind of a nice flat spot up here, and I'm overlooking right below me is the canal. You can kind of see the towpath from here, a little white strip. Um, and then beyond that is the Cuyahoga River. Um, I did. I chose to sit right here um, because this is kind of a, this is a spot where I typically hear cerulean warblers. Um, it has a nice mixture of oak, um, red oak you can see, some beech, there's some white oak, some hickory, um, and up, at, up uh, at the upper elevations here, <clears throat> they like to hang out in, in uh, this forest, uh, associating specifically with uh, white oak. They really like to nest in white oak trees, but then they also associate down in the bottom one forest that you can see below here, which um, uh, is more, you know, uh, has more of a sycamore cottonwood association and that sycamore cottonwood association the floodplain forest is something we typically um, associate with our northern perula up here so it's actually kind of a, an interesting mix where you have the two types of habitats uh, really close to each other um, for both species oh pretty neat and very cool so for ohioans what county are you in technically right now yeah i'm currently in summit county uh, okay. Cuyahoga, Cuyahoga Valley National Park um, is, I, I don't know what the breakdown is, but it's half-half uh, Cuyahoga County and Summit County. All right. Can you tell us a little bit about the National Park, where you are, and a little bit about that? I know it's a, it's a huge uh, birding hotspot uh, for wildlife and the tremendous forest that's there. Yeah. Uh, so the park's about 33,000 acres. Um, <clears throat> large portion of that is mature forest, successional maturing forest. Um, it's all centered around the Cuyahoga River, roughly, you know, 20, 20 plus miles of the river goes down the center of the park. And uh, the park was originally established for its cultural resources. Um, and uh, the, the hope that, you know, between Cleveland and Akron, we saw this urban sprawl just continue to spread. and. Um, uh, politicians and local activists really wanted to see this area protected and so they kind of went to preserve this rural landscape and as a consequence of protecting it and a lot of you know farming being being um, uh, uh, you know stopping not, not as much farming going on in the area 
you know, we've seen succession uh, take over some old fields and forests have been allowed to mature. And we just have like a really awesome infrastructure for exploring the park. Um, the towpath runs the whole length of the river. There's trails that come in and out of the valley. It's super accessible. Um, I think the Beaver Marsh and uh, Station Road are two of the, the big hot spots for birding. And, you know, you can park your car and, um, and uh, get your bird list for Summit County and Cuyahoga County uh, for eBird right there at Station Road. I know people like to utilize that opportunity. Um, and that area is really cool, too, because we actually just um, finished uh, removal of the Brexville or Canal Diversion Dam. So now through the park, the river is free-flowing. So that's really, really exciting. But, um, yeah, it's, it's a really easily accessible park for, for people who inter are interested in seeing a diversity of birds for the region. Uh, that's pretty cool. Yeah, I've heard a lot about the dam uh, rerouting and taking the dams out um, for free free-flowing water and that's really cool so <coughs> awesome um ryan are you an ohioan and and just uh how did someone like you get started or how does someone um get started uh, doing this kind of work yeah so i'm from the east side of cleveland south euclid born and raised i actually live there now took a uh a hiatus where i traveled around and, and um you know, went to school at ohio university down in athens ohio and um, that really was, you know, my formative years in many ways, especially for opening the door for um, finding my interest in forest ecology. I'd always been interested in outdoors and recreation, um, didn't fully know, you know, where that interest stemmed from. And it came, you know, kind of realized it while I was out there in the woods. You know, luckily uh, they had a wildlife biology program, which I switched into from a pre-med major, which was best decision of my life <laughs> um, yeah. and uh yeah just down in southern ohio the the um the forests down there are just i mean relative to you know northeast ohio there's just a lot more area and the condition of the forests are much healthier uh for various reasons um but you still have a lot of that here you have pieces and parts um represented of, of the typical forests of southern ohio representative up up here in, in northeast ohio and the opportunity to work within this area and and help you know restore and recover some of these forest communities and help them become more more whole again uh, is a is uh, very exciting for me you know we're, my opportunity to do that is mainly through a deer management program um, I have no background in hunting really not a strong wildlife management uh, background per se but a passion for the understory plants spring ephemeral plants and understory birds. And uh, when I started a career in Northeast Ohio, you know, it became really apparent that, you know, deer are um, one of the main drivers affecting those things that I really, I really feel passionate about. So I got into researching deer and their, and actually earthworms as well, and their impacts on, on forest communities, and it just kind of took me down this path. Um, for anyone who's interested in a career like this, you know, you really, it's a highly competitive field with people who, um, are just you have to be willing to to take any opportunity that jumps at you volunteer when you can make good connections friends find mentors that, that you know you can't can't speak enough about you know the opportunities that have been um, provided to me just by you know listening to conversations and being open to working with people when they have an opportunity so I encourage anybody out there um, who's trying to get into the field uh, to, to do the same well, that's great. You know, that's, uh, from my view, that's exactly the kind of perspective and attitude that we all have to take now. And then, you know, the demand for uh, really excellent uh, people and work in conservation is going, is the primary driver of everything today. Um, mm -hmm. And it's funny, you mentioned uh, uh, deer and the their effect on forests that uh, Tuesday evening, just this past Tuesday evening, Corey Ringel was uh, our program speaker and she talked about um, Crow Holaka uh, Preserve in Richfield and that that, um, that acreage had been uh, fenced off at one time some year, many years ago and when they went to preserve the property um, for the National Register of Historic Areas uh, one thing that they really uh, liked 
the registry really liked about the um, about the land was that it had been fenced off and it had a beautiful understory that's not not as common or is not present had that not happened. So kind of interesting, but yeah. but really we should talk about so. Um, your your topic hybridization of cerulean and perilla warbler. So that doesn't happen so often, is that right? And what? How did you how did you do that? Did you suspect that there was hybridization going on, or how, how did that all come about? And and I've seen some other scientific references on online um, about it and some other studies. So is there a big uh, research community or like? How, do, how does that all work today? Yeah, I mean, it really, I think a lot of it stems from birders and birding and having a community and a place like eBird where we can share information. Um, you know, that that all kind of evolved out of these rare bird listservs oh. and, and things like that that came from bird local bird clubs. But, yeah, we're really in a really interesting state now where we have the ability to share our information and our observations. But um, hybridization within the warblers is not a rare thing. Um, it's uncommon. Uh, I, I guess, I guess I, I don't, I guess you can say it's rare, but it's not, um, it, pretty much every species of warbler we have, we've observed a hybridization with a different, another species of warbler. And it's not always just like the closest related warbler in its family tree. You know, there can be, you know, more distant, but within that Perulidae, the Perulid uh, warblers, we're, we do see hybridization. Um, and, you know, some, some commonly known hybrids, you know, at one time were thought to be species on their own. Um, and you even see things like the golden wing warbler becoming more rare and impacted by the hybridization with blue wing warblers. So hybridization in warblers is, is a you know, well-studied, really interesting topic, but understanding like why and when and where and how sort of thing yeah. is, uh, is really um, uh, a, a topic of interest to many researchers that I wish I could devote my career to, but you know, gotta, gotta pay the bills, uh, uh, find a job to, um, uh, that someone's willing to pay you to do, but uh, there are people who have, you know, devoted their lives to that. And even Andy Jones at the Cleveland Museum of Natural History, he's been kind of targeted as the hybrid guy. Everyone keeps sending him feather samples, and he keeps on publishing all these interesting hybrid combinations. Um, recently, he worked with, I'm sorry, I don't have the name, but uh, I think it was a University of Toledo student who caught a bird. It turned out to be a hybrid between a uh, cerulean warbler and I want to say a blue-winged warbler or a golden-winged warbler. I, I, I just heard about like yesterday. So uh, we can get some clarity on that if you come to my talk. I'll make sure that uh, yes. I'll, I'll get some clarification on that. But um, yeah, the cerulean and perula in particular, they are really closely related. They're sister taxa. The only closer re relative that the perula has, the, the northern perula has, is the tropical perula. Um, and there has always been kind of suspicion that the two would hybridize. Uh, one of the best documented, clearest records came from Rick Nershel up near Toledo. He documented what was um, named, uh, came from various names, the Perulian Warbler, Nershel's Warbler, uh, Toledo Warbler. I heard various names. Um, and so that, that bird he recorded and got pictures of and had really good documentation of it. And then some more, there's some more observations um, uh, here and there that we try to summarize in our manuscript if uh, we can try and share that with folks. But um, yeah, so th there's, there were observations here and there, but they're all um, just suggestive based on plumage and song. Um, I was lucky, again, I, I worked down in southern Ohio where it's kind of like an epicenter for cerulean warblers, and I actually got to spend a summer um, uh, studying cerulean warbler breeding demography down at like uh, Tar, um, excuse me, uh, Zaleski State Forest and Vinton Furnace, those area, which is now like Raccoon Creek Ecological Management Area, something like that. Um, and you know, just listening to that bird all day, all day, just nonstop, just following these males around, hoping they'll lead me to their female, and the female will lead me to the nest, and you just get ingrained in your head like what that bird sounds like. And so uh, when I started working at Summit Metro Parks, they were very interested in you know, knowing what cerulean warbler population was doing here. So I did, I was doing a little bit of a demographic study, trying to map where they were, find nests if I could. Um, and the one site I had was at Deep Lock Quarry, and I would go there one, sometimes tw twice a week. 
uh, spend the mornings walking around. And the one morning in 2014, I just heard a song that just didn't sound right. You know, it just like sounded like a cerulean, but wasn't quite wasn't quite right. Um, and I, it's a foggy morning, and I wiped the fog off my binoculars and tried to get a, a view of the bird. And I just, again, could hardly tell, but I just knew it wasn't right. And part of my research included uh, color banding, so capturing birds and banding them so we can track them through our binoculars, identify individuals based on unique color combinations on the legs. And so I had all the equipment to catch the bird, and I, I was kind of silly. I didn't. I was like overly excited. I didn't know what to do. I was trying to take a picture of the bird through my binoculars with my phone, and it was just like <laughs> I called my my master bander Kelly Williams and. Uh, she was like, catch the bird, Ryan, what are you doing? And so, I, yeah, I set up the net, and I played, I actually played the uh, song of a, of a uh, perula, kind of an aggressive song, and the bird just jumped right into my net, and once I got it in my hand, I, um, I, it was clear that it was something unique, and characterized it, um, took measurements and tissue samples, blood and feathers, and um, called Andy Jones, like, right away. He was out in the woods somewhere of, like, northern Canada or whatever, um, wherever he goes, um, uh, collecting birds. Uh, so I couldn't get him down there to check it out immediately, but uh, I was able to get him the material and uh, get, get the genetic analysis done. Um, in the process of waiting for that to be done, the following year I actually found a second bird at another site, which was really exciting. I was, like, keyed into it, really looking for them at that point. And... Um, uh, this one was really interesting because after I caught it, it had very similar plumage characteristics, uh, little s subtle differences between the two. But uh, after spending some time in that area, in that territory with the bird, I realized that the bird had a female cerulean warbler tending a nest within his territory. So they, they fledged, I think, I didn't figure it out until, like, they, you know, had already fledged the nest. And I think there was two, maybe three young. And uh, uh, the thing with warblers... And a lot of the passerine birds is you. There's the social mate, and then there's the actual paternal, you know, uh, uh, father, um, uh, individual providing the, the genetic material for the for the for the young. So social mates, you know, they they care for the nest. They'll build. They'll feed the the nestlings. But a lot of times, that male is actually raising the neighbor's young. So wow. it all. It all comes back really to this, like, the, the really interesting part to me is when we start to think about, you know, the how that happens and why. Because, uh, you know, people often focus on the male birds for breeding ecology. But that, that um, female made a decision to mate with a different bird. That female is making a decision as to which male they want to mate with. So whatever circumstances there are, maybe it's just some individuals are unique and like different things that aren't just like them. I mean, we see that in our, in our lives. Uh, some people like to, you know, shack up with someone who's just like them, has all the same interests and likes the same music, but others, you know, like more diversity. And just to, to try to understand, like, why that female chose to, to mate with that male is just a, a question that uh, I, I think about a lot. Um, well, well, you know, i gotta, I got to interject something here from a, a different um, science, and that's social network theory. I have a really good friend, Baldus Krebs, who's actually a Clevelander, too. But Baldus always says that in social network mapping, um, that birds of a feather flock together. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So that, and that might be true, and that's a good strategy, but when your population is crashing, like the cerulean warbler, and actually good in point. Ohio... Actually, in Ohio, northern perulas are increasing. I think the, I think it was like a 300% increase, something, something crazy between the last two breeding bird atlases. Um, you know, maybe they're looking for something different. Um, and so now, you know, we are seeing more, what it seems, more reports of these hybrids. Part of that could be that we, we know they're out there, we're, we're listening for them. Um, and then because we've been able to share those observations through eBird, and I'll check eBird every year, and there'll, there'll be a couple more observations. And, uh, you know, the subtle differences, I mean, they're, they're hard enough birds to see with your eyes as it is. Um, and so when you're looking at a bird, you know, you know, 50 feet up a tree, it's hard to catch that, those differences. And then you really have to know the song uh, well to pick out the, the audio difference, auditory differences. So... Um, yeah, there could be more out there than we realize. Um, 
and uh, it could be increasing. We don't really know. So hopefully people will just keep on, you know, questioning their observations when they see or hear a cerulean warbler. Just take an extra second to double check. Um, try to get a picture, you know, post that, on, you know, using citizen science to really get a, a better idea of what's going on um, in our natural world. I mean, we can't, we can't really figure it out without broad geographic surveys. I mean, our, our review of where these, bird, these hybrids have showed up, you know, goes all across the eastern United States, but it kind of all is all at the same um, latitudinal line. Uh, and uh, it's, just, it's just interesting. It's kind of where the hybrid zone, like the, the northern Perula's southern breeding zone, because they kind of have a disjunct population, so it's kind of they have a southern and a northern zone, and then the there's, I have a map of this uh, in the manuscript we created. We can pop up on the screen if that's possible at some point. But, uh, sure, that would yeah, be just, good. Yeah, just kind of like all across one area where this is like maybe the overlap between the southern mm -hmm. range that might be moving north and into the Cerulean territory that's declining. I don't know. It's just, it's a lot of it's conjecture, but it's a mystery that we um, you know can come up with some hypotheses and utilize whatever data. Uh, like, you know, citizen science gathered eBird observations or whatever we can get to uh, test those. Um, yeah. Well, it's certainly, you know, like in everything else in science, um, you know, we have to ask the question, how is climate change driving survival? And is this an example? I'm sure you, you being a bird, bird, bird species expert, along <laughs> with so many other people in your community, no, no about that. So I can see how your research is is really critically important. And as you mentioned, um, you know how how um, how are people who might be interested in helping to spot this? Um, uh, I would imagine they need to train, as you did, uh, train in the audio, being you know uh, knowing the bird song and then knowing the locations. Sounds like a lot of opportunities for uh, citizen scientists and scientists. So yeah. very good. Well, yeah, absolutely. well, Ryan, thank you so much for spending this time with us today. Um, and for everyone who's watching and listening, please go to wcaudubon.org and go to the news blog, and you'll see um, we'll post certainly post this video, and we'll also post the uh, program announcement, so you can see the details of when the Ryan's program and presentation will be, and also you'll want to register. Um, everyone is welcome to these programs. You don't need to be an Audubon member to, to uh, participate. The public is welcome. So again, uh, Ryan Trimbath, uh, ecologist, Cuyahoga Valley National Park, is going to be speaking on hybridization of cerulean and brula warblers on Tuesday, September 1st at 7.30 p.m. So, Ryan, thank you so much, and uh, maybe for those of us at home, maybe you can flip your viewer and give us a last view of that beautiful forest. Yeah. Everybody get outside. National parks are uh, a great place to go, but please respect them when you come out here. We're seeing lots of people out here. Just come out and enjoy quiet places. <laughs> Thank you, Ryan. Yeah.